I, it's difficult, loved ones, to go too long, uh, at least it seems for me to go too long, without uh, testifying again to what Jesus did in my life. So I'd like to do that simply. Uh, it's not Abraham's covenant, which I will do next Sunday, I promise. Uh, I was uh, uh, a Methodist minister in Ireland, and uh, I sensed that God wanted us to go to London to study, so my wife and I went there, and really didn't know what to do next, and uh, was a Christian, and knew that God had forgiven my sins. I knew that from I was 17 when I went to university, uh, the whole business of sex uh, and the uh, impossibility of doing anything about the strong drives that I had in that direction brought home to me the power of sin and the need to at least have it forgiven. So when I went up to university in Ireland when I was 17, I got down to what was to Protestants a dreadful thing, the Stations of the Cross. I began to spend my prayer time thinking about Jesus dying and trying to get it through my own thick head that He had actually died and that there was a piece of soil in Palestine where His cross had actually been thrust into the ground. And gradually, as I thought about that and my mind dwelt upon it, I came to the conclusion He had really done that. There was really a man, Jesus, who had a beard that you could maybe smell if you were close to it, or He had ears like mine, and He had clothes on, and He had actually died on a cross in Palestine, and he had died looking right down the centuries past the Roman soldiers to Ernest O'Neill and saying, Father, forgive him, for he knows not what he does. And so it came home to me when I was 17 that Jesus had actually died for me, and that because he had died for me, God was willing to forgive me my sins. So I had been born of God when I was 17. And that from then on, I had a Bible study and a prayer life, not daily, but pretty close to daily. And then I sensed, of course, God calling me to the ministry, and that's why I went into the Methodist ministry. Now, after teaching English literature for a couple of years in Ireland, I went into the Methodist ministry and then ended up in the position that I've described, where I felt God wanted us to go to London. We find ourselves in London in the Methodist church there, and then what next? and I didn't really know what to do. Because my life, even though it was Christian, and I was committed to the ministry, was not what it was meant to be. I didn't know what was wrong then, but I knew it, this is not a wonderful life. My mother would often say to me, Ernest, Christians are supposed to be happy. And I mean, it was just like a sword in my side because I wasn't happy. I was worried and anxious and concerned and troubled most of the time or a lot of the time and very tense. And yet I was a Christian. And so I knew that something was wrong but didn't know what. So when it came to whether I'd go back to Ireland or stay in London, I just at last just said, Lord, I don't know. And I began to seek God eh, fairly much day after day in London. Where should I go? And uh, through in prayer came America, and that was the last place I wanted to go because America had a lot of money, a lot of commercialism. It wasn't the place where you wanted to go if you were really serious about God, at least as a little Irish minister. And uh, I felt I was serious about God. But that was the only answer I got. So I went to my neighboring pastor and said, did you know anybody in America? And he said he knew the Bishop of Minnesota and he'd be out in London the next month. So eventually I had dinner with the Bishop of Minnesota and ended up here in Minneapolis. That was about 20 years ago, the same uh, year that Kennedy was assassinated. And then I got into the Methodist ministry here in America, but found the same problem there uh, as I had in Ireland. And it was this, and I can tie it down very precisely. A lady could come in to my study after I preached a sermon and could say, well, I didn't think this and this and this was good, and I thought you could have left that out. 
And I sat, I've told you before, some of you, but some like Bob and others haven't heard. And I would sit in my chair because in seminary we're given smiling classes. And I would smile <laughs> because you're supposed to smile when they tear you apart. But it didn't really matter. Inside in my heart, I was resentful of her. And I had rising up within me a whole feeling, what right is she to talk about my preaching? What does she know about homiletics? That was one of the problems. A rising up of resentment and criticism towards other people, which I did not show on the outside, but which were inside all the time. And uh, that was inward sin. I didn't know about that. I didn't know the distinction. I knew it was there, but I didn't know what you could do about it. But that was one of the problems. Didn't show on the outside because we were, well, I had trained myself, I suppose, to discipline my outward expressions to other people so that they wouldn't see what I was really thinking. But I knew what I was thinking. And of course, it really makes a break between you and the person you're speaking to because they think you're one thing and you're really another. So you don't feel in communion with them. They may feel they're in communion with you, but you know right well they're just in communion with a hypocritical appearance that you're putting on. So that was one problem. Another problem was selfish ambition. I don't know about the brothers here. We men are taught that we must achieve things. And we get the idea that we must make a niche for ourselves in the Hall of Fame somewhere. And I certainly was convinced of that. And felt often driven by a selfish ambition to be uh, somebody important, somebody well-known, somebody famous, for people to like me, people to respect me, for to be successful, to be able to write back and tell my mother what I had done in this world or something like that. So selfish ambition which often drove you to be very jealous of anybody else who did anything half reasonably. So uh, even if Diane sang a song or if Al sang a song or somebody else did something well, that wasn't doing me any harm at all. Yet I was so preoccupied with being center stage and being the important one that I would feel jealous of them or envious. Not that I even wanted to sing. I just feel I didn't want them to be that well-known or well-liked or well-respected when I wasn't. And so selfish ambition begot in me jealousy and envy and, of course, a lot of pride. And that was the second plain thing that I knew in my life, pride. And uh, I, I've shared it with some of you before, but uh, I, I'll say it again because it is so ridiculous now when I look at it. But I remember what it was. It was pride in my own insight into Christianity and my ability to explain it to other people. That came to me, I'll tell you later, one night when the Holy Spirit gave me a revelation and came in those very words, you know. So I had pride. And it was a thing that was debilitating because you'd preach a sermon and everybody would say, oh, that really brought God's Word home to me. But actually, you took that to yourself and said, that means it was a good sermon and I did well and that I succeeded and I'm very clever and I can really see truths about God and obviously I'm very good at communicating them to other people. So actually, it stole the whole joy and delight of being any use to God at all because I was so concerned with pride in what I could do. And of course, that's what brought the resentment when somebody criticized you, because you felt, no, if you could see all the good things that I do, if you could see all the wonderful things I do, you wouldn't criticize me. And so there was a great deal of reaction against any criticism because of that pride. The third thing was just very plain, it was lust. And I don't know how you all are, and eventually, I suppose, as life goes on, we uh, get too old or we wear out or something. But it seems to me most of us men anyway 
find we have tremendous problems with unclean thoughts, with fantasy life, not only involved in dreams at night, but the terrible thing are the conscious dreams that we have during the day and the fantasies and the playing with the unclean pictures and I suppose the unclean movies in certain situations and above all the way it spoils your relationship with our dear girls here, you know, where they actually are often very open and very straight and don't have those same feelings about us. Often they are very appealing in the holiness and the goodness of their feelings towards us, but of course we are always after the main chance and always with an ulterior motive in the back of our minds. And so lust was a pretty constant problem and spoils all that you try to do, of course, with the opposite sex at all for Jesus' sake, and much that you try to do in your own marriage, because those of you who are married and still have trouble with lust know that it really spoils marriage too, and it prevents it being a relaxed and lovely and beautiful experience. And so those were the things that were working inside me as a Methodist minister. And I was by that time, I suppose, when we came here, I was about 29 or 30. And so I'd been in the ministry about eight or nine years by then. I went in when I was 21. And uh, yet it was no better. It was still the same. It was this struggle within and this pretense on the outside. In fact, really, the, there's no question. There's no question what was my favorite. It wasn't my favorite verse. But it was the verse that described. You don't need to look at it because you know it so well. But it was the verse that described... Uh, my almost, well, certainly almost daily experience. Uh, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. That was it. It was Romans seven fifteen. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. When I look back on it, of course, I, I really did what I wanted. I mean, that actually wasn't exactly true that in fact describes the situation of a Jew living under the law. In fact, if anything, it describes an absolute non-Christian. And uh, in fact, I didn't, I did do the things I wanted. I pretended that I wanted more holy things that I read in the Bible and the things that I'm supposed to want. But actually, I did what I wanted because I found inside me that there was a irrational streak that wanted things that I, as a Christian, was supposed not to want. This irrational drive within me wanted to jump into bed with some girl. This irrational drive within me wanted everybody to praise me. This irrational drive within me wanted my satisfaction, wanted everybody else wiped out and me elevated. So I found that there was a strong drive inside that actually produced a wanting of its own. So in a deep way, I did do what I wanted. It's just that, in fairness, I suppose, there seemed to be two eyes. There seemed to be an eye that wanted those things, and there seemed to be a little weak eye that did want something of Jesus. And, of course, that was the Spirit of Jesus. When I was born of God, the Spirit of Jesus did graciously come into me. And that's the situation we're in when we're carnal Christians because that's the state I'm describing. I was a carnal Christian. And I had, in fact, received the Spirit of Jesus into me. And it was him that drew me into the Methodist ministry. I mixed it up with a lot of my selfish ambitions and tried to dirty it and spoil it, but he still kept wanting his Father. And it was his Spirit that made me want to pray at times and to read the Bible, or oh, made me want to preach or to help other people to know Jesus. And it was his Spirit that at times wanted God, and it was his Spirit that pointed out to me that these other things were wrong. But then beside me there seemed to be this old man, this old self that wanted all these sinful things. And I, that was my situation. I saw no way out. I had not heard of any way in the Methodist church. Uh, I had not read of any way in the literature. I was brought up as a fairly liberal uh, Methodist the theologue. And uh, I had not read anywhere that you could do anything about those things. Indeed, I felt that that was the fight of faith, that throughout your life 
Your job was to hold those things down. Indeed, in my sophisticated, semi-sophisticated way, I thought that, that is where discipline comes in. That is where maturity comes in. That is what growing in grace is about. And I always looked forward to growing in grace to the point where I would have victory over these things. But uh, I would have to admit, if you had pressed me, that I wasn't much better now than I was nine years previously. In fact, I would say that I was worse because these things became more subtle in their expressions. You became cleverer at holding them down. You became cleverer at avoiding them or evading them in your own conscious mind because they brought such tears to your eyes and such frustration to your heart. So that was the situation, loved ones. That was the, that's a carnal Christian. And that's what I was. I didn't know it then. I was invited to a little Bible school in North Minneapolis uh, to speak because I was the new Irish minister come to the Methodist church, you know, a few blocks away. And <clears throat> so they invited me to speak at the uh, little chapel hour. I don't know why I spoke about it, but the closest that I could see to any kind of hope was a sermon that they had given us in the 44 standard sermons of John Wesley that we had to read in seminary. Now, uh, they did not give us the good sermons, but they gave us at least this one, which was closest. And it was the one in 1 John 3 and 9. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. But Wesley in that one does not go into the details of deliverance from the power of sin or deliverance from carnality. And he just states it pretty clearly that if you're born of God, you don't commit sin. And you can't get out of it by saying, oh, well, that means I don't on the whole commit it. You just don't commit it because you're free of it. And so I shared that at the little chapel hour. In other words, really what I did was share my best aspirations, I suppose. I realized this was a Bible school. I was a miserable old liberal theologian that was hardly meant to believe the Bible. So I'd better share the best that I knew. So I did share that. And of course, it was from my heart that I said, I believe it's possible sometime to come to a place in your life where you can live in this. You can live, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. You can live like that. Now, I had a theological problem, obviously, in my own understanding, because I was born of God, but I did commit sin. And so I couldn't make sense of it. But at least I shared what I, what I thought. And there was a man sitting at the back with a bald head, and he uh, had no clerical collar on, which is ridiculous to anybody who thinks he's a minister in Britain. And uh, he came up to me afterwards and introduced himself and said to me that he was the pastor of this church. And I thought, how can you be a pastor if you have a collar and tie on? But he must be a pastor. And then the guy started to tell me that he used to be a used car salesman. And I thought, here am I sitting with my degrees and all my training, and this guy's a used car salesman. Well, the sooner I get off and get on with my work, the better. But uh, he, of course, started to talk with me, and uh, saw a honest light in his eyes. I think that's it. An honest light, you know. Uh, he didn't know Greek, didn't know Hebrew, didn't know all the stuff, but he seemed to be honest. That came through. So I talked with him a little in a study. He started to tell me a story. He told me that his church, which I won't give you the name of it, is no longer existent, and it would put you off if I told you it. But his church, which had Methodists somewhere in the name, specialized in this very issue that I had touched upon in the chapel hour. Well, I hardly knew what issue I'd touched upon the chapel hour. I <laughs> just had spoken the best I knew. And then he went on and started to tell how he had been a missionary in Bolivia for years in that church and had tried to preach this, and yet he had not experienced it at all. And then he began to outline, still didn't, I didn't know what he was talking about. Then he began to outline in detail, he began to describe me. He was actually describing himself. But he began to describe me as he described the state of his own inner heart. Because most of us, if you're sitting here and you're carnal, you, you recognize yourself. It's not me I'm describing. I'm describing you. And as he started to describe his own heart and his own experience of defeat in the Christian ministry, in the Christian life, so I began to realize somebody else has experienced this. 
And that was the first time that I had heard anyone talk about these things. I had known them in my own life, but I had never known anybody to talk about them in their lives. And I assumed that everybody was either playing a game or was not having the troubles that I was having. And he described exactly the carnal state of his own Christian heart, the problem with inward sin that he had over years and years. And then he said, but then I came to the secret and I found the deliverance that God had prepared for us. And he didn't actually go into much detail. He said, I found that there was only one way, that all my problems, so I'll just tell you, as he told me it, and you may put up with it, and maybe it'll do you more good than all my complex explanations anyway. He said, uh, uh, I discovered that all the things that I had inside, my lust, my pride, my selfish ambition, the anger, the jealousy, the envy, all the inward sins that rose up inside me and that I could not hold down, I just kept from expressing them outside to other people, came from self. They all came from self. And then I saw Romans 6 and 6. I, I didn't know even, I mean, I knew Romans, I, I don't know that I knew what Romans 6 contained. I certainly didn't know what Romans 6, 6 contained. And so he said, Romans 6, 6, you know, says, our, I think he used King James, our old man was crucified with Christ. Our old man was crucified with Christ so that we might be delivered from the power of sin. And I had never, I had heard of it, but I had never noticed it before. And he said, the old man is the self. And I at last realized that my old self had been crucified with Christ. And that the moment I was willing to die to that self, and that's what he said, and you mightn't like it, and the psychologist might mince meat of it, but that's what he said, and it was gospel to me. He said, I realized that I had to die to self. I had to accept what had happened to me in Jesus. And the moment that I would do that, that moment I would be delivered from the power of sin. And so he then described to me how he began to seek God and asked God to show him himself in all the clear reality that God could see it and to give him judgment day honesty with the inward sin that was within so they would not cover up anything or pretend anything wasn't there but would absolutely be honest with God. And he said he began to do that. And then he said the Holy Spirit he began to show me things. And I knew the Holy Spirit. That was the third person of the Trinity, and he was the kind of force that came upon the work of God. But I, he seemed to talk about the Holy Spirit like a person, and I never had heard that before. And he said, the Holy Spirit helped me. He began to show me things within that I had never seen myself. And he began to reveal to me what I looked like before God. And I began to see how rotten I was and how absolutely ugly I was. And I saw myself in ways that I'd never seen myself before. And I began to be sick and tired and sore. And I began to give up any hope that I could get rid of such a monster as I appeared beside the pure and holy Jesus. And then he said, I came eventually to the place after several weeks of seeking where I said, Lord, I'm willing to do anything to be delivered from this. And he said, God's Holy Spirit, that moment came in and cleansed my heart. And I was delivered from that power of self. And I no longer after that had that agonizing trouble with the lust. I had no longer the rising up of anger inside. I still remember him saying it. He said, there was no rising up from within me. Well, I listened to him, and of course, I don't know, if you're like me, your heart is hungry, you know. I was desperate for anything that would uh, bring deliverance. And it didn't, I mean, I, didn't, I don't know that I even had my skepticism alive enough to be cynical about it. I just knew that if uh, 
that's possible. That's what I want. So uh, he gave me a book, Possibility of Grace, which I've shared with some of you, you know, written by an old Methodist bishop years ago in America. Possibilities of Grace. And I uh, <clears throat> went home and didn't bother with all the uh, palaver at the beginning. I looked up the chapter. I think he calls it uh, holiness or sanctification. And it says, how to obtain holiness. So oh, that's what I wanted. I looked right at that chapter. And uh, <clears throat> I started to read. And you can read it too. It's in the libraries. You know, we have it. And we can put it in a little tract if you want it. But how to obtain holiness, how to be cleansed from sin, how to be sanctified, how to be filled with the Holy Spirit, how to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, how to come into full surrender, full consecration. It really doesn't matter, you know. The Baptists talk about it as full consecration or full surrender. The Methodists don't talk about it. The old Methodists talked about sanctification, entire sanctification. Pentecostals tend to talk about baptism and the Holy Spirit, though they don't always mean an inner work as well as an outward work. But uh, that's really what it is. It's the fullness of the Holy Spirit within you. And I began to read how you should obtain that. And first of all, he said, see yourself as you really are in God's eyes. So I started to do that. <clears throat> I know, I know. You all say, you poor soul, you'll drive yourself to distraction through introspection. Well, I didn't know any better. And that's what I did. I looked at myself as plainly as I could. I looked as plainly as I could at those things within. I didn't see many of them at the beginning. I didn't see that pride in, into your own insight and into Christianity and ability to explain to others. I never suspected that. I just started to look at the bad things inside me and to see what a rat I was and to look at the things and stop evading them and to see that they were there. And that was me, Ernest O'Neill, that I did not just speak unclean words. I was a man of unclean lips. I was this person. This was me. It wasn't just little things that I was doing. It wasn't little traits or little human tendencies. It was me. This was the real me, filled with lust and pride and filled with selfish ambition. I didn't get very far, and I came to a position of frustration, I must admit. And it was then that I remembered what this man had said about the Holy Spirit. And so, for the first time in my life, I began to speak to the Holy Spirit. That is, I treated him as a real person. I remembered in the New Testament, Jesus had said he was a counselor. So, I reckon that's what I need. I need a counselor who will show me deeper, because I'm at a, a blank wall here because I was going as deep as I had got before with my introspection. And so I began to speak to the Holy Spirit, and I said, Holy Spirit, will you show me myself as God sees me? Show me myself until I'm sick and sore, tired of myself, and I'm willing for anything so that I can be delivered. Give me a new conviction of sin. And loved ones, I did that, and I can't apologize for it, you know. And I feel for all you we souls who get all tangled up with false condemnation, but I have to testify to what God did in my heart and to how he worked with me. And I had to ask him to bring me a new conviction of sin. And if you say, oh, you poor sick creature, that's what I was then. But I knew that I had to see what was wrong in my life the way God saw it. I had to come to the place where I was willing for whatever deliverance he had for me. So I asked the Holy Spirit, show me, Holy Spirit, show me how I look in God's eyes. Well, that's when insights such as I said to you would occur to me. You know, I'd waken up in the morning with certain words on my lips that obviously had come from the Holy Spirit, and he would have shown me a whole depth of my life that I'd never seen before, a whole gross monstrosity of self that no one had ever known and I had never known was there. And that's why, loved ones, I think it is a supernatural work, you know. Even in the seeking, even in the conviction of sin, it seems to me it's a supernatural work right at that early stage. It, it is a revelation of things that you have not seen that only God can see in you. And I sometimes think that that was maybe even the beginning of my deliverance because it was kind of separating myself from self, you know, and saying, Lord, I cannot deliver myself from self. I need you to do it. It was, the be it was the ceasing to be God in my life, you know, to be my own God and to control my spiritual experience. 
It seems it was a going out to God, a reaching out to God and saying, Lord, you'll have to even show me what's wrong in my life. And so the Holy Spirit did that. And then this book said that you should see that you can do nothing about that, that that self of yours has a grip on your life that you cannot break. And that carnality within you is so subtle. It loves religion, just loves it. It loves a lot of the things you do in your Christian ministry. It loves a lot of the good things in life, as long as Satan can hold on to your will. And so you will never track down that old self. Of course, that's the error that I had always made before. You know, you control it or you tame it. You train it by reading the right books. You pray a lot. You have cold showers. You do all kinds of things to try to control that old self. But this book said, you can do nothing. This is part of Satan within you. It's like a spy of Satan's inside your heart. It's a self that is not under your control. It's part of Satan's kingdom. You have to be delivered from it. And so I thought about that and prayed about it, you know, and as the Holy Spirit, of course, continued to bring out more of the hideousness of my selfish will, I saw, yeah, I cannot. And I tried, you know, as we all do, we try to do works worthy of repentance, which we always should do. We should always try to obey. And I tried to obey and tried to get rid of these things. And of course, the more I tried, the more distraught I became and the more despairing I became and the more convinced I became that this is right. I cannot deliver myself from and then, of course, the third step that this man said was, see that it has all been done. See that it has all been done. See, and then he got the same verse, Romans 6 and 6. See that your old self was crucified with Christ. And so I began to think about that verse. And really, it didn't mean too much to me. I could get it intellectually, and I could look, I think it's palaios is the Greek word, meaning old man, you know, and I could see that it had been translated old man in King James, and I could see that crucified was the aorist of the Greek verb, you know, and meant that it had been done in a moment and was finished with, had occurred at a moment in time. I saw that. I saw that that's what it meant. I didn't understand how my old self could be crucified in a moment in eternity, but I saw that that's what the Greek meant. It meant that it had been done. It didn't mean that I had to crucify myself. So I saw the foolishness, you know, of old Luther even and the others trying to beat themselves with chains or kill themselves or, or crucify themselves. I saw, yeah, that isn't it at all. It has been done. I was crucified with Christ. And I saw that and I believed it. And it said, you know, in Romans 6 and 11, reckon yourself therefore to be dead indeed unto sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So I did that. I even knew the Greek word for reckon, you know, it's legidso, consider, treat yourself as being really dead with Jesus. Well, I did mentally and intellectually. I tried to do that. I tried to believe I am dead. I was crucified. It's finished. And I'd get up the next morning and I'd have the anger or the lust or the pride, you know, and there would be no change. And so it went on like that. <clears throat> and I had by that time dealt with my outward sin, so I was back in what you talked about. I was at least back in a justified experience, you know. I was at least back obeying God outwardly anyway, so I was back in salvation, which I had at least, you know, whether you believe you can throw it away or whether you believe like me that you can be alive but live as if you're dead. You know, it's, it's kind of rather a game with words. I was not in the full joy of Jesus anyway, uh, and I got back into the joy of salvation, but I was not making headway on this deliverance from inward sin and the old self. And so I kept on trying to believe, trying to believe. And then gradually it dawned upon me what he had hinted at in his book. He said, to really reckon yourself dead with Christ, you have to be willing to die with him. You have to be willing to die with him. Now, I would say that was, throughout the whole experience, the biggest new fact. Well, the, the personality of the Holy Spirit was very new. But probably the biggest new fact was that one. 
that I had to be willing to die with Jesus. Because we'd always been taught in seminary that Christ died for you so that you wouldn't have to die. And in fact, that's where we got a kind of a, almost a demonic joy, you know, good, he suffered, we don't have to. And it was kind of a relief, good, I don't have to die for my sin, he died for me, so that's great, I'm scot-free and can do what I want. And that had always been a pretty important tenet of my creed. But this was new, this whole thought, you are to be willing to die with Jesus. And then I began to realize, well, of course, God has done the thing in Jesus, but he won't force me to enter into that. He will ask me, are you willing? I have already done it in my son. You don't have to make it real in you. I will do that but you do have to be willing. And so that's where the pilgrimage began. I began to deal with my own heart and will. Am I willing to die with Jesus? And I began to think, now what does that mean? And I began to ask the Holy Spirit, will you show me what it meant? It might have been different for John Newton, you know, or Dan Salem or Tom Stocking, but what was it for Ernest O'Neill? Lord Jesus, what did you bear in your own heart of my, me on Calvary that I need to be willing to let go of and to die to? And then the Holy Spirit, you know, began to dig and dig through the layers and the layers. And you dealt with the things that were most obvious, you know, would you be willing <clears throat> not to lose your temper and you used your, you know, you had to ask the Holy Spirit, now why, why is that a big deal? And he would show you, well, you use your temper to actually hold people off, you know. You use your temper to get control of situations that you've already lost control of. Now, would you be willing not to lose your temper? In other words, would you be willing not to have control of those situations? And that, of course, involves all the different situations, your job, your home, your money, your salary, your future, and that means you have to be willing to trust God with those things. So I went through that kind of thing. And it's the same with the lust, you know. Uh, would you, what was it like for Jesus? Well, he had no woman. He was not able to jump into bed with some woman. He never did have intercourse. And would you be willing, if necessary, never to have intercourse? Would you be willing not to, if that was God's will? He may not make it your will because you're married and it's normal for that to be the relationship, but would you be willing if he wanted? Most of all with us men, you know, would you be willing when he wants or when your wife wants, not just when you want? Would you be willing to die to your right to that? And that's what it began to come down to, more and more. Not attitudes even, but rights. Would you be willing to die to this right? When Jesus died on Calvary, he was looked upon as a criminal, uh, they misunderstood him completely. Would you be willing to die to your right to be understood all the time? Would you be willing to be misunderstood and be happy and content? Would you be willing to die to your right even to have uh, two coats to your back? Would you be willing to die to your right to a good salary, to die to your right to marriage, to die to your right to a successful future? Would you be willing really to be with Jesus on the cross. And more and more I asked him, Lord Jesus, will you let me see what it feels like close to you on that cross? And would you help me to see what it means for me, Ernest O'Neill? And the Holy Spirit would go on and on. And of course with me, it's different with all of us. There's some besetting sin in your life, you know. It may not be the obvious one. Only the Holy Spirit can show you. But it's usually the one that holds all the key to the thing. And for me, it was one Saturday morning in my parsonage in North Minneapolis. The Holy I was praying. I was just spent a lot of time now praying, you know, and the Holy Spirit said, would you be willing to be nothing if it were for Jesus' glory? Would you be willing to be nothing? Would you be willing to be a zero? Would you willi be willing to be a failure? Well, that was the very opposite of all that I had been taught in my education I should be. It was the very opposite of the motives that often moves those of us who are actors or preachers or public people. Uh, it was the opposite of what was the tenor of my life. Would you be willing to be nothing for Jesus' sake? Would you be willing to be a failure 
would you be willing for your mum back in Ireland to think you died? She heard so little about you. Would you be willing to be nothing? And that was it for me. But it's different with all of us, and that maybe when we get to heaven, I'll find that wasn't it. You know, it was just Jesus. Would you be willing to be with me, my son on the cross? Would you be willing to be in me and to be wiped out as far as this world is concerned and to have a tombstone erected now uh, with your name on it? Indeed, not even a tombstone with your name. To have a tombstone with nothing on it. For you to become public property for me, would you be willing to be nothing and to be an absolute nobody for me? And then uh, that, that was a miracle, you know. So then I said, yes, you know, and then me. No, uh, I didn't. I spoke in tongues about a year and a half later, you know, and I don't know that tongues are a big deal in the thing anyway. I think there are many of us that haven't spoken in tongues, and I don't think that's an issue. But certainly I didn't then. But there was a, an absolute confidence that the Holy Spirit had come into my life and filled me and cleansed my heart. I felt a cleanness inside. I felt a cleanness. There's a line in a First World War poem that goes, it's a misinterpretation, of course, of the First World War, like swimmers into cleanness leaping. Well, that's what it was. It was like a swimmer into cleanness leaping. It was the first time I had not had this refuge and garbage and dirt inside my heart. It was the first time I had not had a fountain of strong desire for lust or envy or pride or anger or jealousy coming up from inside my heart. And so it was just a quiet sense. I, I don't know. I don't know if I testified. I don't think. I bet I didn't testify to my wife. I bet I thought if this is real, my wife will know it. But it was just a quiet sense in, in the bedroom. I know it. And I think it's still there, that, that room. A quiet sense that the Holy Spirit had come into my heart and had cleansed me and filled me with himself. And I had, of course, the immediate proof of it. I've told some of you before about two of the issues. <clears throat> you know that one of the most difficult situations, and many of you have dealt with them, is divorce. And it can be a most unpleasant thing for everybody involved and certainly for the minister involved. And some of them are so nasty that you just don't want to tackle them. And I was in the middle of one of those, you know, and, uh, and uh, I, a note was passed to me by my secretary, you know, will you call Mrs. So-and-so, and I knew what that was about. And normally, I would do what I think all of us carnal Christians do. I'd run my own life. That's really what we do. We just obey God when it suits us, you know. But we run our own life most of the time, and we make things convenient for ourselves, and that's why our life gets all piled up. Do you know that? I never had enough time for things. I never had time to do everything. It, my life was always chaotic and panicky because I never had enough time because I was always lining all the things back there, you know, to, to do them my way, to do the things suitably and conveniently because I could divide them up into the pleasant things and the unpleasant things because I was still alive and I was still controlling things. But now it was different. Ernest O'Neill was crucified with Christ. There was no self rising up inside the note came, I lifted the phone and called the lady and got right into the messy situation. That was the first time, instant obedience. It was a great relief to instantly obey. And you could instantly obey because there was no longer any interest in yourself and in your own convenience. In fact, your life was a schedule for him to write. It was no longer a schedule that you had filled in all day as in, and these things I want to do and these things I want to achieve, and I'll try to work you in where I can, Lord. But it was now, all that is wiped out. It's dead. It's finished. Now, Lord, whatever you want, that's what counts. Then the next morning, I got an, a letter from a friend of mine who had been at seminary with me. I had been at seminary. I'd gone to seminary with the more degrees than anybody else and was ahead of most people. And, of course, was always anxious to get on that old academic uh, uh, success uh, line. And uh, yet God had constantly made me want to find out how does the gospel work. So I constantly preached in churches to find that out. Meanwhile, some of my own colleagues had streaked ahead of me and got their doctorates. And one of these, of course, was in Garrett Institute, I think, in the University of Chicago. And uh, it was now a doctorate, in, a doctorate in psychology. And he wrote to me from time to time, 
Every time he wrote, of course, you can guess what I felt. You know, I felt, why didn't I get going? Why am I doing that? How jealous I am of him, etc., etc., etc. So the letter came, I opened it, and there was no jealousy. You know. It was just a miracle. I knew there was a change in heart. So that changed my whole life. Uh, then, I, everything didn't go beautifully. Everything then fell, the roof fell in. Uh, all the outside things, I began to preach that in the Methodist church, and they didn't like it. And everything <clears throat> came down around your ears, and I left the Methodist church and uh, was without work for nine months a year, and ended up then, you remember, uh, some of you know, teaching in Benilde High School. And, I remember saying to my wife, love, you know, I, I, might, I think I might never preach again. But there was no, I wasn't concerned about it. I was happy. Lord, whatever you want me to be, I'll be. If you want me to preach, I'll preach. If you don't want me, I won't. So there's a great rest. I would say I entered into the second rest of the people of God. Uh, the rest that God entered into on the Sabbath day when he ceased from his labors. And it seems to me that's what you do when you at last accept your position with Jesus on the cross, you cease from your labors. You stop laboring to be God's child. And Jesus himself takes control, and he does it through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that changed my life, loved ones. And then from then, you, some of you know some of the progress. But uh, I had to tell you because a little of woes me, if I preach not the gospel and old Jeremiah, it burns in your bones. And I just thought when you said that, I have to. You can only go so many weeks, and we've been committed in Romans, you know, to certain other truths that are good, and tonight to the Old Testament. But I felt I had to tell this tonight. And, uh, oh, that's true, and it's for you, you know. But I'm not doing any commercials. It's so true that it doesn't need selling. It's God will do the same for you. The Holy Spirit will deliver you from the power of sin. And if you say you mean you uh, have power to suppress the anger and the envy and the jealousy, no, no. That's, that's the battle I fought when I was a carnal Christian. No, you're delivered from the envy and the jealousy. The envy and the jealousy do not rise up within you. You feel Jesus rising up inside you. And it is a deliverance, and it is a victory. And, of course, it's, it's uh, the full Christianity. And it's the full gospel. And uh, you, uh, you have to go on. Uh, that's what uh, m uh, others, I see some sitting here whom I love. Uh, you can't go away. You, you have to go. That's what I saw. It was either hell or heaven. After God began to make this plain to me, and I began to see the truth, I knew that it was either heaven or hell. You have to go on. And those of you who are born of God, you have to go on. There is no way back. There is nowhere to go back there. The bridges are burned. There is no way back. Hey, you remember the old-fashioned evangelical phrase, you're spoiled for the world. You are. You can't ever go back to the world. You will always feel that you're living in an anticlimax. You'll always feel you've left the best if you ever go back there. No, it's only on. You can only go on. So tonight, go on. Go after it with all your heart. Hunger after it with all your heart. And God will bring you. I didn't have a whole lot of information, but I had a hunger and I wanted deliverance. And God's Holy Spirit met me as he will meet you. you know. Tonight, yeah, you could. We could have an altar call. Now, I'm sure that many of you would come up, you know. But I would say this to you. That you have to get to the point where you're determined, you know, after the benediction, everybody gets up and all that kind of thing. You have to get to the point where you determine you'll stay here, you know, and you'll seek God <clears throat> if you can't seek him at home. Or if you think, no, I dare not go out of here, you know, Satan will get me before I get home. Then you should go to the prayer room. You should go to the prayer room or, or go back into the corner somewhere and seek God, you know, and, and seek him. And if you want help, I think there are enough of us here who are in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and I'd ask them maybe to stay around that they can come over. If you just raise your hand up, they'll come over and pray with you, you know. But uh, really what I would urge you to do is either that or to go home and to get down to business with God and don't give up until you come through. Because unless you're determined, it has to be, I will not let you go until you bless me. 
It has to be that kind of attitude. It might take you weeks. It might take you months. But uh, if you want that with all your heart and you keep going, God will answer you because that's why Jesus died. Dear Father, we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus died to save us from our sins, not to save us in our sins, but to save us from our sins. And we thank you for that, Lord. And we thank you that his death was effectual because we were actually in him when he died, that our old self was crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. And Lord, we thank you for that. That each one of us, and indeed every soul that has ever lived, or will ever live, has been crucified with Christ. And that that has been done. And that it is our great privilege to bow before our Savior and accept from his dear hand the benefits of his mighty death. Lord, we thank you for that. Pray for each other, our Father. Pray, Holy Spirit, for each other that we may get down to business with you this evening at home or here, and then in meetings like the Baptism of the Spirit seminar on Sunday mornings here at 9.15, or wherever we can get hold of that great pearl of great price that is worth selling all the other pearls to get. Lord, we thank you. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and evermore. Amen.